Let's get seated, everybody. God bless you guys. Welcome once again. Next week, we're going to be getting back to the Gospel of Luke. We kind of have a little bit of a departure today, something that I've been praying about, thinking about, and just considering what God's doing in our church and, and uh, kind of the direction that he's taking us. So this is a, one of those kind of uh, stops where you kind of recalibrate and kind of, kind of assess how things are going uh, with the church. You know, the church is not a, uh, it's not a machine. Uh, with a machine, if there's a broken part, you just come in and replace the same part, and it just kind of keeps doing its thing. It kind of keeps producing something. Uh, machines don't have personality. Machines uh, aren't designed to change. Machines are designed to stay the same, but that's o- absolutely opposite of the church. The church is an organic body created up of Jesus as the head, and then we are parts of the body. And so there's always a flux. There's always seasons of a church. There's an ebb and flow uh, with the church. It's always that way. And so people, people come, people leave, God relocates people, any number of things. And so uh, today's one of those days where we're kind of considering what the Lord has been doing with Cornerstone uh, 2.0 and what we believe he wants to do in the future. So look at your notes there. This is a little bit of a recap of what's been happening uh, in the last uh, 18, 21 months, uh, something like that. What is the church? Some people think of the church as a bus driven by the pastor who takes passive passengers to where they should be going and make sure they enjoy the ride. Like, it's, like I, I'm the driver, uh, I'll assign you to a seat, and you're going to sit down and you're going to like it. And I'm taking you somewhere and, and you don't have any say in it, and it's, it's that kind of thing. But that's not at all what the church is, is about. When the, when the Bible describes the, the thing called church, the organization called church, uh, the gathering called church, uh, it's in terms of a body and it's in terms of a, of a living organism. And so um, the church uh, is designed to, uh, to have everybody involved, uh, either inside the building on the grounds here or out in the community. I was tempted to show you guys a little video today, but I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to do it. But, uh, you know, I'm an old Saturday Night Live guy. I don't know if there's anybody else out there that used to, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's, this, there's this skit that they do, and it's, just, it's really simple, but it's really funny because um, there's, there's like a suave, sophisticated, kind of debonair guy. He comes waltzing in, and there's, there's four ladies lined up, and he's saying, would you like to dance? Oh, I'd love to dance. And then, you know, how about you? Oh, just give me a chance. And, you know, they're just kind of... And then he gets to the fourth one, and the fourth one, her hands are about this big. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, let me give you a hug. You know, it's, it's like this. It's like, it's so funny because it's so unnatural, you know? And I was thinking... Boy, you know, the, I mean, how would it be if your hands were that small? You'd have to say, well, let me pick up my Bible. You know, you'd have to use your elbows or something. There's no strength in your hands. And it's, it's hilarious because it's so unnatural looking. But it kind of made me think about sometimes how sometimes the church can be that way. You know, it's like everything is going pretty well, except those, they, they have really tiny hands, you know, or, or there's just something that's off, you know. And uh, I was also thinking about, have you ever seen pictures of guys that are weightlifters? And from the waist up, they're, they're huge, you know, but then they have little chicken legs, you know, and, and there's always a kind of a joke about it, a kind of a meme where it'll say, you know, don't skip leg day, you know, guys that love to build up their biceps, they stand in front of the mirror, but they wear sweatpants at the gym to hide their bony little legs, you know, and it's an imbalance, you know, and so the Bible talks about uh, as we gather together every member doing their part. Everybody's saying, God, this is how you created me to be. This is what you made me to be. These are the gifts you've given me. And Lord, I want to use them. And, and once again, so the Bible never describes the church as a bus that you get on the bus and you just kind of look at the scenery and, you know, and get a tour. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of like in the Navy, they would say all hands on deck. You know? Every, everybody jump in and, and, and use the gifts that God has given you. So, some, just some visuals for you there. I hope, I hope they're not distracting. <laughs> I wanted to kind of go over the history of Cornerstone since we regathered. In 2018, I, I handed the church off, and um, I began to travel and teach uh, internationally in Bible colleges and stuff. A lot of you guys know this. Some of you might be new to the church, so just a little brief history. 
Also from 2020 to 2022, I filled in as a transitional senior pastor in Calvary Chapel in Vallejo, which was a blessing. Uh, pastor Frank Richards, our friend, who went to be with the Lord. Uh, they didn't have anybody lined up to, to take over the church, and I just said, hey, at the time, I wasn't doing anything. I said, I'll come and, and kind of help keep the, the boat going in the right direction. But I didn't really pastor it as if I were going to stay uh, because I knew I wasn't going to stay. I didn't feel like God was calling me to stay. Um, and so I didn't want to kind of come in and redesign the church and then the next guy have to come in and say, oh, that's not the way I would have done it at all. I kind of wanted to leave a blank slate. So with that in mind, I pastored there for two years and the Lord brought Nathan Kate and Danny Kate, uh, missionaries who were in Brazil, Americans, and now they're, they're, just, they're just a perfect fit down there and the church is really prospering. In 2022, it became evident that Cornerstone 2.0, we call it, needed to kind of relaunch again. And so we started a home fellowship on Friday nights. About 15 people came. And I remember, I think, the first night we had 25. We were like, wow, 25 people, you know. And it, we were Jim and Jenny Haug's house, and it was crowded. And it, but it was wonderful, and it was real simple. And we worshiped, and we studied God's Word, and we loved each other and had great snacks. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was great, you know. Uh, I think Nicole and Rick's kids were the only kids coming at the time. So there's two kids. Throw them in the bedroom, you know. There's no blood or screaming, everything's good, and, and uh, it, was real, it was real easy, real simple back then. In January 2023, we started meeting on Sundays, and the church started to grow. We were meeting over at Napa Christian School, and so that was a blessing, more people were coming. But still, with the way things were then, uh, it didn't take a lot of people to kind of do the work of setting things up and kind of... Uh, doing things. We, we started, we got our uh, banking in order, so we needed somebody to do the books. We needed somebody to, to receive the, the offerings and count those, and more kids started coming. So things kind of started to grow, but still it was kind of, you know, uh, it wasn't, it was pretty, pretty manageable at the time. But currently, the church has been going through some growth, you know, and because of that, and that's a blessing, you know, our goal is to not grow the church, by the way. That's never been my goal. Um, you can, there's ways to grow a church, but, but not grow Christians. And you can get people in seats by doing certain things, but I've never been interested in that. I've never been taught that, and I don't believe in that. I believe that the Lord uh, grows the church the way that he wants to do that. My job is to help you guys be uh, the best Christians you can. That's my job, not, not, to, not to put more people in the seats. And so we're going to be talking about that today. But currently, because of the church growth, it's kind of time for us to kind of say, oh, we're kind of at, we're kind of at another phase now. And, and I think that's why it's good to kind of notice that and say, you know, how, how's things going with Cornerstone 2.0? Oh, the church has grown now, and, and I, I believe in my heart, and this is why I'm saying these things, uh, that this next season for us is going to be a, a real season of equipping and mobilizing people and helping people find their gifts and helping people to step up into ministry that have never thought about it before. Or maybe others that have been in ministry, but maybe kind of got off track or just took a, took a break for a while for whatever reason. I kind of feel it's really time to, to really sink our roots in deep, uh, deeper, with more people involved. On, on page one there in the notes, my current plans, desires, and responsibilities. Uh, between 2018 and, and 2022, I made... Uh, 20 international trips. It was crazy. I think I was gone 16 or 18 weeks a year. Not this year. <laughs> I have one, one six-day trip planned in October. We planted a church in South Baja. I'm going to go visit those guys. Everything else I've canceled because um, I just believe that God wants me here to really take care of the church and to be with you guys and to meet with you guys, to care for the church corporately, to care for you guys individually as, as the Lord would uh, have me to do that. Or, you know, we all obviously have other pastors here, Pastor Ryland, Pastor Matt Mittman, Pastor Matt Scott, other leaders here that are here to serve you guys. But I just have such a strong sense, and not only a strong sense, but a strong desire to, to be here. I just, I just want to be here. And I really believe that's God's uh, call for me in this season. I want to help. Yeah, okay. I'll take it. Food is better, but clapping will do. It's okay. I want to help people grow in their understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Go deeper. I'm, I'm still trying to go deeper. Guys, I've been kind of at this for a while, but I'm still trying to go deeper with Jesus. 
number of areas in my life where it's like, you know, it's not that it's bad, but there's more. I mean, how can we ever exhaust a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? And so that's my desire. I believe the next season for Cornerstone is to grow deeper as individuals and also deeper as a church. I was thinking, you know, oftentimes Christians pray for revival, and that's a good thing to pray for. But what if, guys, what if 100, people showed up, and 100 additional people showed up next Sunday with 40 children? Could we, could we, could we serve them? Are we ready for something like that? Um, I've heard it said that success, and this is a secular phrase, but it, it has some great truth to it, success is when preparation meets opportunity. Does that make sense? It's like you've been studying a certain career and you need a job, so there's, there's a need, there's preparation, and suddenly there's an opportunity and you're a perfect fit and suddenly there's success. And I'm just thinking, I just think God wants us to, to go deeper with him and to go deeper in the church and to deeper in the community as well. When I use the term ministry, I'm not just talking about in, inside the church building or over in the classrooms or over in the youth room, but also in the community. And the Lord's stirring my heart about some things that we can be doing to outreach in the community. I'll be sharing those, those things with you. Maybe not today, but, but soon. But, um, you know, what if 100 people showed up, you know, and suddenly we're like, where do we put them? What do we do? Oh, you know, it's like, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, we want, to, we want to be ready. We want to be seeking the Lord for people's lives and for their salvation. And so, you know, another question for us is, um, how are we as individuals and as a church impacting our community? Um, certainly all of us, I would hope, are, are living out Jesus in front of people. But I think there's some things that we can do as a church, as a group, to also impact the community. I'll just tell you now. I mean, wouldn't it be great, guys, if we just emptied out room four and had a, a, a thrift store there to give away clothes? Clean out, number one, clean out your closet that you've been intending to do. Bring them here, and we just open for three or four hours on a Saturday. We could meet so many people that way. We could bless them, number one, but we can meet people, you know? That's not hard. What are, what are the things that Cornerstone can do? What are the gifts and talents in this room? You guys might have gifts and talents that I don't even know about. Maybe there's something bouncing around in your head. You're thinking, man, I wish Pastor Bill would just think of this. I didn't. You did. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> you know, uh, you take the wheel on the bus. I want to just look around for a while, you know. It's, it's, it's that group effort kind of thing. There's so many things that we could be doing if we're praying and seeking the Lord. Lord, how can we reach out to Napa? How can we impact our community? How can we interact with people that don't know you? How can we love them? How can we bless them? And so that idea is just really bouncing around in my head. There's some false ideas about the church. Um, look, at your, look at the bottom of page one. I really, if, if, if anybody kind of believes these things, let's not. Some believe that the church exists to carry out the visions and the dreams of the pastor. I disagree. I remember a dear sister telling me one time, you're the pastor, we're just the worker bees. God tells you all the good ideas and we just carry them out, you know. And at the time, I should have said no. It's not that I necessarily said yes, but I just thought, well, I'm not the only one that God speaks to. <laughs> You know, he speaks to all of us, hopefully, if we're listening. Amen? And so, you know, uh, but that's the idea in a lot of churches that, you know, oh, the, the pastor is the anointed one. He's the only one that God talks to, and we're here to serve the whims and the visions of the pastor, you know. I disagree with that. <clears throat> There's a verse that I saw years ago in a church, and it was posted in the foyer, and, and it struck me as kind of being partly true but not one of those verses, it's Proverbs 29, 18. And this is from the King James Version. Look at your notes there. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And the pastors in the 90s would use that verse to say, we need a vision, the church needs a vision, and God has given me a vision, now this is what you're all gonna do. God has spoken to me, I'm the leader of the church, this is what you guys fall in line, I'll just tell you what row and column to be in, and everybody get their marching orders, and just, you know, that's not how the church works. But that was a mentality 20 years ago, 30 years ago. I see the wisdom in, ha in having a sense of what God wants to do in somebody's life. I absolutely see that. But it's not just from the guy that's up here on Sunday. It's for all of us. All of us. And so I'm going to be asking today, what has God been putting in your heart? Has he been putting anything in your heart? If he's not, then maybe that's your first prayer. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You created me to do good works. What is it that you want me to do? 
And so all of us, need, as Christians, need to be praying that. And I realize for some of us, it might just be, some of you moms, like Matt was saying, God bless moms. God bless moms, you know. It's like, man, that's, that's, a, that's, a, full, that's a full-time job, you know. That's your ministry, to raise those little sinners up to know Jesus, you know. <laughs> and and, uh, and that's, that's, you're not available to, for much more than that. But that's beautiful. That's, that's the, the, the responsibility God has given you. But all of us should have a sense of, n- not just of duty, I mean, and even for a mom, not just of duty like, oh, I'm just here watching the kids. No, you get to watch your kids. God has called you to do that. And so whatever we're doing, whether at work or anything, to have Jesus like right on our sleeve. I remember being unemployed and needing knee surgery. That's a bad combination. And I went to like this kind of like free clinic where they let like orthopedic students work on you. <laughs> I had more work done since then. But the, but the nurse had a necklace that said, Jesus heals. It's exactly what I needed to see. I was away from Jesus at the time, but she affected me. All these years later, I still remember that. It's 40 plus years ago. All of us should have a sense of like, Lord, whatever I'm doing, whatever, whatever job I have, wherever I live, whoever my neighbors are, whatever my talents are, whatever my desires got, it's all for you. I'm not just a you know, passenger on the bus. Lord, you want to use me. And so... I disagree with this idea of there's no vision, the people perish, therefore the pastor dictates to the church everything that they're going to do. I don't think that's a biblical, that's not a biblical description. The vision doesn't just come from the top. The vision comes from all of us. Now certainly as pastor of the church, I've been given a responsibility to to oversee some things, but I don't come up with all the ideas. I remember some years ago... uh, Missy Alcazar, you guys know Cisco and Missy, a lot of you, and we, we were at a church over on Laurel Street, and uh, I never stopped to think about what maybe the nursery looked like. There was, there was nursery-age kids in our church, but I never stopped to consider that because our kids were older. And she, she came to me one day, and she says, you know, Pastor Bill, we love the church, but the nursery is a mess. I'm like, oh, I never thought of that. Ooh, ooh, you know, kind of. And it's like she pointed something out to me so we could change it and bless other people. That suggestion came from her, and it was a good one. That's how the church needs to function, guys. First, we take care of our lives with Jesus. We, we're, we're taking care of the home. We're taking care of our marriage. We're taking care of our children. But then, but then, Lord, beyond that, is there anything else that you have for me? And if so, can I share it with the church? And I wonder if there are others that would like to get involved as well. I remember some years ago, there was a couple guys here They didn't ask me permission to do this. They just started making sandwiches and going out on Saturdays feeding homeless people. I heard about it after a couple of months. They didn't need permission. They just had something in their hearts, and they started doing it. It's that kind of idea. So my job, I know you're you're wondering, what what does this guy do? My job is to help each of you grow in your faith through teaching and counseling and correcting and exhorting and encouraging And after that, my job is to help pastor you in your service to God, uh, to give advice. You might say, hey, Pastor Bill, I think maybe we want to do this thing. And I say, well, let's talk about it. And, and And I may say something like, well, be careful about this, and this is where it could go wrong, but this is a super good idea, and let's invite more people to be a part of it, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of just kind of the field marshal in some ways. So all that's the backdrop of what we're going to look at today. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, and uh, this is real familiar territory for a lot of you, but I just kind of want to go over it again, and then, like I said, next week, we're back to the Gospel of Luke. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, <clears throat> down to verse 16. Let me just read it. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To each one of us. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave, and he himself, Jesus, he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of, de- of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, that we may all grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That Apostle Paul could really write a run-on sentence, couldn't he? (laughs) Boy, he just has so many ideas here. Verse 7, let's look at that. To each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Guys, every single, every single one of you that's a Christian has been gifted. Every single one of you. I, I've been gifted to be a pastor teacher. Uh, you know, you know, you know the, the scope of that, of that gifting? It's right in front of me. This is the scope of my gifting. This is what God has given me to do. I'm not a megachurch pastor. I'm not a missionary pastor on a beach in Indonesia. I'm a, I'm a pastor in, in Napa, California. And this is what God has called me to do. But you have a calling too. You have a calling. I, I just, I, I so want you to believe that, and I so you want, so you want, to, so you want you to be convinced of that. That if you, if you have Jesus in your heart, you have a calling. And once again, <clears throat> it may just be for the things in front of you to ca- take care of your family right now, and and maybe they are requiring the majority of your time and whatever time's left over. You know, you need a little relaxation, a little recreation, and, that, and that's kind of the scope of your life right now, and that, that's beautiful. That's fantastic. We need Christian families, don't we? That was pretty... <laughs> no, let's just have secular families. Who cares what the kids do? Just give them money in the car keys. Who cares? No. And we need Christian families to raise, to raise children, to raise grandchildren. We need that. So important for the fabric of our community, for the moral stability of our culture. We need godly parents and godly kids and godly grandkids. But the point is, in verse 7, each one of you, every every single one of you, has a gifting and a calling. I remember when I was dating Debbie. Debbie's, that's my wife, by the way. Um, Her maiden name was Dury. And she was so holy. Her dad used to call her Sister Mary Deborah, you know, (laughs) compared to me, you know. But I remember her mom telling me one time, and she called me William, and Debbie calls me William at home. When I talk to myself, I call myself William too, just to let you know. And, but, she, but she said, William, I think you may have missed your calling. And I wasn't walking with the Lord then, but it just struck me like a ton of bricks. It's like, I would never want to miss my calling. What am I on earth to do? And, you know, I, like I said, I wasn't walking with Jesus when her and I started dating, but it just hit me like, I don't want to waste my life doing things that I'm not supposed to be doing and missing the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And every single one of us, I just want to encourage you guys. God God has his hand on you, has a calling for your life, and he wants to use you. It says it in verse 7, to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifting is measured out to him, you know. The cornerstone is, is what he has measured out to me. And so it doesn't matter how much of a gift you have, just, just run in that lane. Be that person that God has called you to be. You know, when the church isn't functioning, uh, you know, when we have small hands in the church or chicken legs, <laughs> imagine if somebody had small hands and chicken legs. That would be awful. But when, when the church has small hands and chicken legs, the church isn't kind of running on all cylinders, you know? And it's, it's for each one of us to step up and just, in the, in the quiet of our hearts, just say, Lord, what do you have for me? I want to do that. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter if I feel disqualified. It doesn't matter the mistakes I've made in the past. God, I've blown it. You know that. I believe you've forgiven me, but I don't think you could ever use me. Yes, he can. He wants to use you. And he's measured out gifts to you. And so all of us are gifted. There's kind of a strange verse in, in Judges chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. In, in ancient battles, when, when a king was defeated, uh, it, they didn't always execute them. Sometimes they'd cut off their thumbs and their big toes. 
They can still live, but, but you can't go back and fight anymore. You can't run without your big toes. They provide a lot of stability. You can't grab a weapon with a thumb. You can still live, but you're, but you're limited. And it's like, it just, you know, watch out for your big toes and thumbs, you know. <laughs> Steel-toed boots or something, I don't know. But it's like every part counts. That's the point. Every single part counts. In verses 8 to 10, there's so much there. Let me just kind of gloss over it because that's really not the main point of what I want to cover with you guys today. But it says, therefore, he says, verse 8, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Uh, I'm going to skip over that right now just for the sake of kind of what we're focusing on today. But it basically just says this. Jesus was the victor over Satan. When, 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 a, when a general defeats his enemy, he takes all the spoils and gives them away to his people. And Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. It says in the book of Colossians that he disarmed the principalities and powers. He took, he took their, their strength away. He took their domination away. He took their dominion away. And he distributes gifts to the body of Christ. That, that phrase right there would have been very uh, familiar to the Hebrew mind. But basically, Paul is saying, listen, you've all been gifted. You know why? Because Jesus won. Because Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. Therefore, he's coming back as the victorious general, if you will, the victorious captain. He's distributing the gifts to all of his people. Dear brothers and sisters, please, 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 please. Did I say please? Please, never think you don't have a gift. You do. Amen? Can, can you say amen? Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe it? Please believe it. Don't tell me, please never tell me, oh, but Pastor Bill, I just feel that. Cancel those feelings. We're not going to live by our feelings. We're going to live by God's word. Amen? We need to live by God's word. And God says you've been gifted because Jesus has gotten the victory. And he took all the spoils and distributed them among his people. Verse 11. And he himself, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles. These are offices in the church. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So, look at your notes. Apostles were first century leaders. They established the doctrine. Uh, the, The phrase technically means personal ambassadors. Prophets are those who speak God's word, either predictive or otherwise. Uh, When we have our our times of praise and prayer once a month, there is often prophetic words that are spoken. Words that are not predicting the future, but words that are addressing uh, the, the corporate condition of our hearts together. One of the words that has been spoken over our church, and a lot of us agree with this, is that the the Lord wants Cornerstone to be a soft place where people can lay their head. And I just say amen. May may we be a church that welcomes people, is gracious to people, and allows them to come and just rest and be rejuvenated and built up again. And so that was a predictive, not a predictive word, I guess kind of predictive, but prophetic word. Evangelists are those who preach the gospel, pastor, pastor, teacher. It's one office with two titles. Pastor is somebody who kind of shepherds and watches out for people. Teaching is what I'm doing right now. So all four offices are needed by the church, but that's Jesus' design. So, um, that's why I'm so happy that God has put it in my heart to, to just be here. Honestly, after my trip to Vizcaino, I don't know when I'll go travel again. I just want to be here. I just, I just want to be here. And please, I mean, thank you, but I just, I, I want to be here. This, God has so, so put it in my heart and a lot of our hearts to be here, to be a blessing, to help you guys, to, to, to untangle all the knots that come at us in life and to, to get rid of the fears and, and, and get beyond all the junk behind us and just go forward in Jesus, in faith and in hope and expectation. And so... You know, that's, that's the pastoring part. The, the teaching part happens when we're sitting one-on-one or on Sundays or other times, but it's also the pastoring, which sometimes says, hey, I know he doesn't look like a wolf, but he's a wolf, you know. There's some of that too. And so all of that goes on. Why, why is all this necessary? Look at verse 12. Uh, all of these offices, all of this is about you guys. This whole thing is, is supposed to be and is designed to be for you. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, that's Christians, equipping 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the equipping of the saints literally means to put things back in place. When a doctor would set a broken bone, he'd put things back in place. And so that's the idea of equipping, to put things in their proper place, to bring things to completion. It spoke about the mending of the nets. And so um, I'm going to help you fix your nets, and I'm going to help you reset your broken bones. <laughs> Ooh. With, with a good dose of you know, pain medication, localized anesthetic, you know. But that's, that's, that's why we are here, to help you guys, to be a blessing to you guys. By the way, can I invite you to do something? Um, and I remember Ryland saying this a while back. I'm going to kind of paraphrase you a little bit. But, you know, he said, if you want to be a friend, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. But also, if you need some help, let us know. <laughs> well, all the gifts that I've been given, reading your mind is not one of them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And, you know, sometimes I'll hear somebody's really going through a hard time and go, oh, man, I wish you would have told me. You know, I would love to pray for them and encourage them and visit with them. And so uh, that's, that's why we're here. And, and please don't ever say to me or to any of anybody that's serving here, I'm sorry to bother you, but we are here to be bothered. <laughs> we are here for that. We are here for you. And so please never think that you're bothering us. The work of the ministry is done by God's people, all of us. The leaders in the church have responsibility to equip people to serve and to direct their service as God leads. So, Pastor Chuck Smith, my pastor, the, he says the primary purpose of the church isn't to convert sinners to Christianity, but to perfect the saints for the ministry and edification of the body. So, that's why we come together, to get built up, to get strengthened, to be encouraged. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 9, this we also pray that you may be made complete. I know, I know a lot of this stuff can seem like, oh man, it sounds like such a lecture. But to kind of keep it humorous, ju just, I just want you to think about yourself spiritually. Do you have chicken legs or little hands? And you know, you know you just, that's not the kind of selfie that you want to post on your social media. How long have you been a Christian? 30 years. Wow, that must be a great life. Yeah, I still got little hands, though. You know, it's like, you don't have to have little hands. You don't have to have chicken legs. You know, Christian maturity isn't measured by how many years you've been a Christian. It's measured by spiritual health. And we, want to, we just want to help you guys be as healthy as you can. He says this, for the edifying of the body of Christ through teaching of God's word and all of those things. Verse 13. How long do we do this? I'm glad you asked. Until we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to the, a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When the Bible uses the word perfect, it doesn't mean without problems. It means mature and complete. Uh, we keep doing this so that all of us can be more mature. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that God just allows me to keep being modified and keep being changed, you know? I know I'm not the guy I used to be, and I know that so, so many of you are not the, the people you used to be. God, God is in the business of helping us to grow, to not be immature, to not say things, oh, well, that's just my Irish temper. You weren't born again into the nation of Ireland. You were born again into the kingdom of God. <laughs> we, are to, we are to be, if we're staying close to Jesus, we are looking more like Jesus all the time. All the time. How long? Until you're dead. <laughs> and go into glory. Until you leave this life and go into glory. Then, then, then he's finished with you. He'll be finished with you when you, when you cross through that, that little thin, invisible veil between mortality and immortality. Until then, we're all moving forward. And this is, this is what Paul is saying here. How long till we all come to the unity of the faith? The knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, a, a, a mature man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's how long we keep reading God's word and keep fellowshipping with God and and, and growing together. 
David Gusick says this, when gifted offices work right and the saints are properly equipped, there is increased maturity and greater intimacy in our experience of God. Paul compares a childish, immature, immature church with one that is mature. So offices and mature saints work together to accomplish this. And, and once again, sadly, uh, maturity isn't based on uh, age. Maturity is based on maturity. So it's a, it's a sad thing and a blessing for me. You know, I, I've been to a lot of Bible colleges, and usually at the Bible colleges when I'm teaching, the, the kids, for the most part, they want to be there. I mean, they're, they're willing to, like, study, like, hours and hours a day because they really, really want to be there. And, and, uh, and I hope these things don't discourage you, but there is a place to be challenged, and so I do want to challenge you. Sometimes I tell some of my students, I said, you know, you're 22 years old. You're more mature than people three times your age in some instances. More mature. Just because they, are, they just are just dedicated, you know. And, and man, I just don't want to, you know, I never want something like that to happen to me or any one of us. Like, let's, let's be mature. Let's grow in Jesus. Let, let's, uh, let's move forward. Verse 14. Paul's describing here what can happen, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So guys, there's people out there that want to they wanna, they wanna fool you. There's people out there that want to deceive you. And they're tricky. They're really good at it. And, um, you know, usually we don't tell our fellow adults, don't talk to strangers. <laughs> Mark Opus, don't talk to strangers. I mean, Mark kind of knows that, you know. I would tell my grandchildren, don't talk to strangers, because, because they're still young, you know. And so sometimes, once again, uh, we can be absolutely saved, absolutely on our way to heaven, and absolutely needing to be warned, don't talk to strangers. And it's just, it's not like it should be. And so Paul's just praying for these guys and just saying, hey, watch out, there's people out there to get you. There's people out there to deceive you. Verse 15. Instead, let's be speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Speaking the truth in love means to be instructing, correcting, restoring, rebuking. That takes some work. Those are ing words. Those are those are action words. That means we're applying ourselves, and we're receiving uh, that kind of information from other people. And whatever is said, guys, look at verse fifteen. But speaking the truth in what, in love, that we love each other, we love each other, that we receive. Uh, words of correction, words of instruction, because Lord willing, the person that's speaking to them or to us is doing it in love. Maturity is described as growing up into Jesus. He's the head. We never grow independent of Jesus. We grow up into, into Jesus. Finally, what's the evidence of, of maturity? Verse 16. From whom the whole body, <clears throat> excuse me, Joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I love that Paul says, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Guys, I need you guys. I, I love when you guys speak into my life. I love when you encourage me. I love when you maybe speak a word of caution to me. Something I need to hear. I have blind spots too. I know that I have blind spots. We all have blind spots. But if you're helping me discover my blind spots and I'm helping you discover your blind spots, we're all better off. And so we need each other by what every part does. According to the effective working by which every part does its share. And what's the result? Causes what? You guys are right with me, aren't you? <laughs> Verse 16. What does it cause? Growth in the body. Thank you, Scott. Causes growth. And not, and not primarily numerical, though, though that, but growth. I could start asking you guys a bunch of questions, and your hands better go up. I would, I would say things like this. I'm not asking you. Who wants to be more like Jesus? Who wants to be more loving? Who doesn't want to be so sensitive anymore? <laughs> Who wants to be more forgiving? 
Who, who wants to not be so sensitive anymore? <laughs> uh, you know, all these things, you know. Who wants to get over that, that sinful, nasty habit that you just are not telling anybody about? But, I mean, all of these... Now, we got you on camera on that one. Okay? But, I mean, all of these things. It's like, I'm, I'm tired of feeling defeated all the time. Jesus wants you to grow. Get rid of the small hands, you know. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Like, he wants you to grow. And this is how it does it. By me doing my job, you doing your job, you encouraging me, me encouraging you. None of us sitting passively on the bus with Pastor Bill driving the bus, the wheels on the bus go. You know, it's like, no, it's like this whole thing. I, one, of my, one of my hopes and dreams this year is that, that we, we end up having ministries in the church or in the community that have never entered my mind. Things that I've never thought of things that I never would think of, but God puts it into your heart. God puts it into your soul. God gives you a hunger for it. You, feel, you constantly are feeling like, man, I've just got this thing gnawing at me. Of like, it sounds kind of crazy, but I think we should have a hot rod show and, uh, you know, and, and invite a surf band. And I think, you know, it's like, I would never think to do that. I'm not a hot rod guy. I would want a, like a guitar show or something like that. Or something. But what, what is God putting in your mind? What is God putting in your heart, you know? What can you come and say, hey, Pastor Bill, I've been sitting on this thing for a couple of years now. Do you think maybe we could do a knit, knit arama? you know? And like, sure, I, I won't be there, but let's do a knit arama. And, and then suddenly all these ladies come and like, man, we've been looking for people to knit with. And, and suddenly they're knitting for like four weeks in a row. And then finally somebody says, man, I just really have bad dreams every night and I'm scared. And can I pray for you? Oh, yeah, I can, you know. Just joining ourselves together with people in the most unlikely ways. Guys, look at, in, at the bottom of your notes there. Um, I just listed some, some emails. Uh, what is God putting in your heart? What, what is God putting in your heart? For general questions or ideas, and right now I'm overseeing the worship ministry, we, we, we would encourage uh, more people to be involved in, in worship. God, I have a teenager lined up. I'm not going to tell you who, but we, got, we have a young person that's going to be kind of joining us probably. It's exciting. I just discovered it. It's kind of tripped over this young person and found out that they're, oh, I'd love to play. It's beautiful. So general ideas, general questions, worship ministry, anything at all, just shoot me an email and, and just say, hey, let's do this thing. Pastor Bill, could we do this thing? Children's teachers and helpers. My wife has been heading it up. There's her uh, uh, email address. Cleaning, cleaning this building and parking assistance. Don Barber, you know, sheesh, that guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, if a church still saint sainted people, he'd be the guy. Th this place doesn't clean itself. I mean, there's people here for hours when you're gone. Um, can you, can, you, can you push a vacuum? Don't raise your hand because we, we will get you on camera, you know. We have a pastor cam back here pointing at you, and it's like, but if you can push a vacuum and stay for 60 minutes one, day, one Sunday a month, what a blessing that would be. Just any, any little thing helps. Everything helps. Sound ministry, James. Raise your hand, James. Everybody take a look at James back there, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like he, he inherited like a pile of spaghetti, you know. No, it's, it's a complicated ministry, but he's, he's just diving in and putting in all this time. But if, if that's something that you'd like to learn, boy, we could use more people. There's a couple of spots here in, in the ministry in the church where it's kind of held down by one or two, and that's it. And if they were sick or something, we would have to go without. And it's just a great opportunity. Sound ministry, video ministry, Allison and Andrea back in the booth. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to embarrass them and make them come out, come out and take a bow. Yeah, they would kill me. But, uh, so. Thank you for those of you guys who are serving here. It's a great blessing. Thank you for, thank you for those of you who are making amazing food. Linda Johnson, who? And, uh, <laughs> and others. Thank you. I love, I love hanging around this place after church is done and having great food and having fellowship with you guys. It's a great thing. 
By the way, regarding ministry, sometimes people come and say, Pastor Bill, can I come and serve in the, in the, uh, in the worship team? And, and I'll say something like, only if I can tell you no. Because maybe you're no good. <laughs> you know. Does that sound harsh, Mark? <laughs> people, have the, people have the heart of a worship leader, but sometimes they don't have the talent. <laughs> it's like, you're better, you're better off serving somewhere else. But, you know, the Lord has put me here to help you guys, you know, reach your potential in, in Jesus. Not by making you into something, but just by helping kind of steer you in the right direction. So, 